at the moment. Just to counter your co host, now you can share. Yes. Uh, in the name of God, dear participant, at the moment, my colleague you and I are from Iran as uh, also uh, my dear friend, Prof. Robert from Mexico. Before they start the meeting, uh, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Faizabadi and Dr. Uh, Abdullahi and other members of the Iranian Society of Microbiology for the meeting and uh, uh, everything in during the uh, Congress. Uh, in, the, in this meeting, we have uh, six uh, titles for presentation in this area, new method in the diagnosis and treatment of infection disease. I am Dr. Kalantar and uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Robin from Mexico, UNAL University, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Osanlu and Dr. Masoud Dadashi from Clinical Microbiology, Alborz University of Medical Science and uh, Dr. Purgadam Yari from Clinical Biochemistry Department, Kerman University of Medical Science and Dr. Ali Afkar, Department of Parasitology and Mycology, School of Medicine, Research Center for Hidatic Disease, Kerman University of Medical Science. Uh, at the moment, uh, for the first speaker, the Dr. Robin uh, from UNAL University, speak about the uh, title with the uh, pathway of develop a smart antibiotic and combat antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Robin, uh, we wait for you and you can share a screen and start the uh, meeting with, the, uh, with your title. Thank you, Dr. Robin. Thank you very much for participating for the uh, International Congress of Microbiology. Thank you. You can share and start. Hi, doctor. Hello. Can everyone hear me well? Hello. 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 Thank you very much. Doctor, at the moment in Mexico, uh, maybe uh, 11 30 in PM. <laughs> yes? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. I just had dinner, so I'm okay. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Davoud, for. for You're welcome. Your kind invitation and presentation. I'm very honored to be able to share with you guys a little bit of the <clears throat> some of the work that we have been doing in the development of antimicrobials to um, use against infectious pathogens that cause um, infections and especially pathogens that are resistant to antibiotics. And so just as a few slides promoting um, our research center and where I'm from, we are located in, in Mexico, in the city of Monterrey. Monterrey is a city that it's, uh, Dr. Dabud has visited. It has a lot of mountains. Uh, we're a very mountainous uh, state and there's a lot of uh, active um, out outdoor sports and we are a very industrial city as well. We are the third largest city in Mexico after Mexico City and Guadalajara. And this is a view of, um, <clears throat> let me see if you can see my, this is a view of, of the university library, the central library, which was constructed by one of the very famous um, architects in Mexico called Luis Barragan. And this is our uh, biotechnology 
uh, nanotech uh, research center. It's quite new. We inaugurated it in 2018. And we have different lines of research that are being developed in, in, in this research center. But the most important aspect of the research center is the fact that it includes um, interdisciplinary research between nanotech and biotechnology, including synthetic biology, applied microbiology, nanotoxicology, nanomaterials. And we have several labs um, that are mostly um, <clears throat> uh, that, that dedicate to those lines of research. And I'm currently the director of the center. And so, as I mentioned to you in, within, the, the, within the CIMB that we call, um, which is Center on Biotech and Nanotech, we um, this develop research between the fields of engineering, nanotechnology and biotechnology, which is actually the main research areas that I am actually focused on. And it is quite important to um, the development of novel antibiotics to kind of have this inter interdisciplinary um, fields, since we are able to focus on the development of different aspects to the development of therapeutics, not only the active ingredient, but also the delivery systems and all of the engineering that goes behind the, the, the design of the delivery systems. And so, especially uh, uh, regarding engineering, we have a lot of um, different applications that are currently being developed in this field. And we know that this field, uh, the fields of engineering and applications, such as the development of new drugs, uh, come about when you kind of like develop a baggage of uh, basic science, yeah? And this, this baggage of basic science comes out for um, us to be able to develop engineering areas on these fields. For example, the area of mechanical engineering when the Newton classical mechanics were developed and chemical engineering, which is my field of where I did my bachelor, where uh, with the conservation of mass, conservation of energy and fluid mechanics, then you have all this baggage of knowledge to develop um, chemical engineering. And then we have kind of like the biological aspect of it with the discoveries of two major um, discoveries, which was the DNA structure and the fact that you can have recombinant DNA. And now you have all these tools that you can, that you can use to create bioengineering. And so when you, when you develop um, the field of chemistry and biology, you can come about to develop Tech, different technologies, <clears throat> but actually, when we think about the, the term technology, if I ask the audience what they think about, they, you, you might have pop in your head several things, such as interconnectivity, development of new gadgets or devices, going to other con other planets and conquer them, uh, transportation, connectivity. But actually, there is a uh, there there's a few people that think about technology in drugs <clears throat> or in pharmaceuticals. And these are actually uh, systems that require a lot of technology and a lot of engineering to be developed. Yeah, because um, a smart therapeutic or actually a therapeutic that is that should be useful to us, not only has an excellent active ingredient, but it should also have a target and release mechanism for it to perform its job or it's curating job where it's supposed to go. And then it's not just introducing it into the body and having it work well against the, the, the pathogenicity, but also clearing of the drug. How do we eliminate the drug after the drug has done its job? And so at, in my research group, we are starting from these principles in order for us to design and develop more intelligent drugs. So we work towards accomplishing this by working at the interface of biotechnology and nanotechnology. And there's actually been great advances in the field of biotechnology, especially in the development of um, hierarchical models or complex models uh, from the bottom up, which is actually something really cool. For example, if we think about how all of the um, digital area was, was born and how it has 
uh, evolved, we actually always thought about generating standard components that are the basics of the, the complex systems that we want to work in so that we can then build them together and have complex systems. Sorry for the Spanish here, but it was an article that we just that we published in 2009. And then, but for synthetic biology or for biotechnology in general, we want to emulate what we did with um, uh, an electrical system or the digital era where we create synthetic uh, standardized components and then we can do, we can create novel bio biological trajectories, even cells or um, cellular networks. And so <clears throat> when we, how do we couple nanotechnology to synthetic biology? Well, actually nanotechnology is, is, is an excellent, um, gives us excellent tools for us to interact with biological systems. And why is this? And it's basically just um, explained by the scale. So nanotechnology is a field that studies systems between 10 and 100 nanometers, more or less. And then the importance of nanotechnology per se is the fact that when we have this small um, scale, we can see that the total amount of atoms that are that make up the systems, if we if we divide the surface atoms or the atoms that are exposed to the surface between the total amount of atoms, this ratio is very high, and it changes the properties of the material. So we start seeing materials that are semiconductors in the larger scale that become conductors in the nanoscale, or even uh, materials such as gold and platinum, which are pretty inert in macroscopic materials, will become incredible catalyzers in the nanoscale. And so, but however, the most important part about nanotechnology, apart from the fact that we get this additional set of materials that have completely different properties in the nanoscale, is the fact that on the scale, the nanotechnology allow us to develop tools so that we, had, we can interact with biological systems. When you wanna interact with a biological system or with, a, with any system in general, you need the appropriate tools to interact with it, to do reverse engineering, to do testing, etc. If you have different scales of systems, you cannot use the same tools. Yeah, you have to have build your appropriate tools. So in this case, if we take a look at nano uh, nanosystems, such as the one that we have here, like fullerenes or quantum dots or um, dendromers or liposomes, they are all in this scale between 10 and 100 nanometers. And if we take a look at some of the biological systems at these scales, we see that most of the fundamental biological systems are actually at this scale. So we have these tools to interact with antibodies, viruses, bacteria, or cells. So <clears throat> this area or combining both of this area will allow us to not just interact with biological systems, but also comprehend them, design them, and build new biological systems for many, many applications. So that's what we do in, the, in, in my research group. <clears throat> Try to uh, couple both of these fields in order to develop, one of my lines of research is to develop novel therapeutics to treat infectious diseases. So um, when I started uh, my, my PhD, actually, I started this line of research since I was doing my PhD in 2005. And <clears throat> with the development of therapeutics, I started working with infectious diseases and the fact that um, how can we develop novel antimicrobials and how can we make our antimicrobials that we have currently in the, in the pharmaceuticals uh, uh, more uh, effective against different bacteria. Yeah, because since the discovery of antibiotics, we thought that we had solved the problems of antimicrobial agents. However, uh, we see these kind of graphs all the time where we see that there's a higher incidence of microorganisms that within the years, we see more and more bacteria that are resistant to our different antibiotics, especially our first line of antibiotics, such as the fluoroquinolones. And, and the other thing is that we were also for around 40 years, since the 60s to the 2000s, we were almost had no innovation of new, of new antibiotics at all. And we were kept seeing these resistant graphs. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in collaboration with several universities, we were able, I was able to design a different, some strategies that we have developed in the lab in order to potentiate the antibiotics that we have currently 
to kind of win or at least catch up with the resistance that the bacteria are being developed. So we have this, one of our lines of research is to potentiate current antibiotics and the other is finding novel antibiotics. So basically I'm going to talk to you about this line of research here where we engineer delivery systems that are able to potentiate our current antibiotics. So the delivery systems is one of the most important aspect of a, of a drug. <clears throat> In most, my, my ex PhD advisor, Nicolas Pepas, one of the founders of, of um, <clears throat> uh, deliveries of drug delivery, will always say, in most cases, the most complex part of developing a therapeutic is to design its appropriate delivery system. That is actually really true. There are many molecules that are effective against many diseases, but the fact is that you want to develop a therapeutic that not, is only if, not only is it effect, effective against your, your uh, disease, but also that it doesn't do harm to your health. <clears throat> so how do you develop this delivery system, such as in these uh, cartoons that can be <clears throat> a little bit of a joke, but they're actually true, like this doctor here that says, listen, when the side effects of this medication kick in, you'll forget what was wrong in the first place. So the secondary side effects are actually pretty, har pretty harmful and pretty inconvenient to treat this disease. Or sometimes when we think about and we read the labels of the, of the different uh, drugs, we are scared of all of the secondary effects that we can have. So sometimes you think about if you should cure the fungus on your toe or actually experiment uh, at least for a short period of time, liver failure. And this happens with many drugs is, and also antibiotics, which are very common, such as gentamicin that can cause deafness or cyclofroxacin, which is very harmful for muscles. <clears throat> so how can we make much more efficient antibiotics. We think that we can do very efficient antibiotics, couple them with a delivery system and actually have different designs of therapeutics so that they can have a GPS and actually a shield that is also very important for when you introduce them to the body. So I'm gonna to talk to you just briefly within the last five or 10 minutes about the different uh, strategies that we have taken very briefly. One of them is developing microbial exopolymers, which are uh, bioplastics that are biocompatible that we can couple to different antimicrobial agents so that we can use them as a delivery system. So microbial exopolymers are polymers that are produced in bacteria and yeast. <clears throat> we actually, this is a picture of one of our exopolymers. Yeah, and these are produced by different bacteria. And we can actually have these exopolymers not only are, not only are very good for delivery systems, but they also have many other applications in food, um, in food development and cosmetics and many different other applications. So we can have these bacteria that are kind of factories of exopolymers. And we actually found a very nice yeast here in Mexico in a river that was here uh, close to a um, water treatment plant, where in that water treatment plant, before the water treatment, we had a, a concentration, a high concentration of metals. And so we took some samples of these uh, waters and we had a Rotorula mucilaginosa that we identified. And this yeast was able to produce an exopolymer in the presence of most uh, <clears throat> heavy metals. And so we actually had this uh, yeast being um, um, stressed out and produce uh, a lot of exopolymers. Then we say, if we these, these exopolymers are produced in the presence of metals, we might be able to produce uh, nanoparticles or materials that uh, can be coupled to these uh, polymers in a very efficient way. And so we were able to couple uh, exopolymers to silver nanoparticles, which are nanoparticles that have been uh, reported for many years as antimicrobial agents. But in this case, the nanoparticles are embedded in this plastic. <clears throat> so it can be used as a delivery system. 
In fact, when we did this plate, we were able to put the exopolymer here, and you can see that we have a big halo that induces some antimicrobial activity, especially against the Philococcus aureus. Then we said, can we make these materials even smarter? Could we have them have um, magnetic properties? So we were able to produce not just silver nanoparticles, but silver nanoparticles, which are antimicrobial, coupled to iron. And this iron part of the nanoparticle is magnetic. So we can have um, delivery system that is not just protected by the, by, the, by the biopolymer, but it's also magnetic so you can direct it to a specific site. So you can see here on the, in the, that you can have, these nanoparticles are all agglomerated because they are not in water solution, but this, um, this video is just to, just to show you that the nanoparticles are magnetic. <clears throat> So then we did some in vivo antimicrobial uh, testing of these nanoparticles. And we, we for example, uh, covered a catheter with the bioplastic with nanoparticles, with silver nanoparticles. And so we did a small uh, biofilm infection model where we have here the control, where we have uh, no bacteria. Then we had a catheter that we infected and a catheter that was covered by our exopolymer with silver nanoparticles and uh, that we had induced uh, infection. So you can see that the infected catheter has certain amount of nanopart of bacteria and the covered uh, catheter is basically very similar to the control with non no infection. <clears throat> Just to finish up some of the work that was actually done by a super smart uh, couple from, from Iran, uh, Nahid and Hossein, which were uh, part of my lab and just recently graduated not, not about a year ago. They produced this smart therapeutic <clears throat> where they produce this bacteria that you can control not just by heat, but also by light. You can control gene expression using this uh, biological moieties called thermoregulators. So these thermoregulators is a biological moiety that you introduce in bacteria. In this case, we did it with E. coli. And this biological structure uh, is closed by um, thermal Gibbs energy. So in here, we have a code for protein production, which you can see here that is closed, so the ribosome cannot come in. And when we expose it to heat, uh, because of the Gibbs energy, you can decouple this structure, kind of like a hairpin, and then you can open up the structure, and now the ribosome can come in, and then you have gene expression. So we couple it here just as a, as a small uh, experiment to produce uh, a red fluorescent proper, pro, a protein called um, M-cherry. But also we had a uh, culture where we put um, um, nanoparticles, which actually respond to heating when they are exposed to light. So we were able to control gene expression of a bacteria, not just with heat, but also with exposure to LED light. And our next step of this process is to be able to have a bacteria that in this code is not just M cherry, M M -cherry production or the fluorescent protein production, but we can actually have a antibiotic being produced so that we can have a living therapeutic. We were able to see here that the nanoparticles, you can heat up uh, up to uh, 12 degrees, but highly locally, and then this is the RNA that you can, is closed, but then you can open up. And you can see here that you can control gene expression because this is the bacteria that was exposed to both light and had the nanoparticles inside. You can see that you can grow it very efficiently and have a gene expression production of the bacteria. <clears throat> so with that, um, I'm finishing up my talk just by uh, sharing with you some of the future projects that we are trying to develop, where we are trying to interface both nanotechnology and biological systems, especially in one very specific way. So we have 
nanotechnology is a field that allows us to construct this, uh, this uh, highly um, ordered systems because we can have very highly controlled uh, synthesis, but we can only control this synthesis at a nanoscale. So we can produce very nice um, uh, small nanoparticles, but we cannot produce uh, complex macroscopic structures with that level of ordering at the nanoscale. And on the other aspect, we have biological systems, which actually do the opposite. If you think about just ourselves as humans, we are, we are made up from two half cells that are joined together. And then through biophysical uh, interactions, we create very complex human beings and, 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 and living systems, right? So we go from, from little, biology is very good at ordering. And for us, we are very good at doing small biology, small systems, but we are not very good right now at ordering them. So by coupling these two, we can create very nice therapeutics, I believe, to couple both tools from nanotech to systems and synthetic biology. So with that, I would like to thank my research group, especially, uh, for example, Francisco, which was one of the uh, one of the students that uh, work with the biopolymers, Albert, Javier, which is one of the main leaders in my group. He has not graduated, but in the field of therapeutics and development of synthetic biology. This is Joseina Najid, my um, uh, Iran um, couple superstars, which created that. Uh, <clears throat> we have two papers still coming up on uh, the control of gene expression with light and heat. And also Anna, which was one of the creators of the um, magnetic and super nanoparticle structures. My funding agencies from CONACYT, uh, the Secretary of Education, and some other programs and some uh, right now, the company Sigma Alimentos, which is funding our, our group. And this is my uh, contact information if you want to um, contact me. And I'm opening up for questions. I think we have some minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, Dr. Robbins for good uh, presentation and attractive for us. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, because uh, the time in Mexico uh, may be near 12 p.m. Yes, doctor? Yes. Yes. Yes, but it's okay. If you guys have questions, I'm, I'm open to answering them. Yes, yes. For this reason, because uh, the time is uh, uh, in uh, Mexico is later. Uh, for this reason, uh, anybody have a question, you uh, you you can ask uh, from the doctors. Mm. Any person? Any person have a question? As a question, any person? Uh, let me check the chat. No, no question. No, nobody, nobody. Yes, hi. Yes, hi, hi. Hi, thank you very much uh, for Professor Robin. Thank you very much for uh, his time. Uh, I want to ask him one question. Uh, is that possible to be hope that the delivery system uh, can find a way uh, for new generation of antibiotics? Yes, so I believe that um, if we couple um, our knowledge of engineering and our knowledge of materials and nanotechnology, we can have a very nice set of novel uh, therapeutics, not only for antimicrobials, but for many other diseases. And we can find them. I think that one of the major breakthroughs that have been done in, 
in delivery systems is in the cancer area. So for cancer, since it, the, the, the main problem right now, so how do you cure, or at least how do you attack a cancer patient? If you, if you, if you know a little bit of the therapy, of the therapy, one, one, one uh, um, way to do it is just, so the chemotherapy is just basically poisoning all of your body. Yeah. And since cancer cells are, are much weaker because they reproduce very fast and they are not so strong as our healthy cells. What we, what we hope is that uh, you can kill the cancer cells before actually killing the patient. And that's actually very sad to say, but it's what chemotherapy is. So it's not very localized. So right now, a lot of the therapeutics that have been done is trying to see what is the morphology and physical, chemi physical chemistry of the tumors to kind of have this delivery system that you can actually maybe uh, deliver or kind of like have them be much more dense at the site of where the tumor is so that you can deliver a lot of drug there and kind of like have this um, much more localized treatment. But I think that for, uh, for antimicrobials, I think that the, the, the most important aspect should be, and that is just only a, a, a personal uh, uh, thought is living therapeutics because you can have bacteria that kind of like have a sensor of a pathogen and then they can produce a, 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 a antimicrobial in order to kill the, the bacteria that is pathogenic for you. So I think that is a very nice, and actually you can do kind of like sinusoidal curves where you can have this uh, sense, anti-sense, um, so you can have production and not production and kind of also be able to counterattack resistant of bacteria because you don't, you don't always have this pressure of bacteria, but you're kind of like going up and down. So I think that could be a really cool way to do it. And it's actually something that we are doing in the lab, uh, trying to come up with this kind of therapeutics. Thank you again for uh, your presentation. Uh, and anybody has a, or have a question, you can ask again. And no question uh, at the moment. Uh, repeat again, Dr. Robert. <laughs> the time is in the Mexico is very <laughs> for a sleep and rest. <laughs> no for presentation, yes. <laughs> But okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much for participant and your presentation for me and other colleagues is very attract attractive. And uh, I hope, or we hope, join to your uh, laboratory and work with it other on the uh, different area, especially on antimicrobial resist and, and develop, develop the new antibiotic agent. Thank you very much, doctors. Of course. Again. Yes, and, and um, so just if there are any uh, uh, students that are interested in joining a master or a PhD, um, in, in my university, we have scholarships for students that are accepted to the programs. So we have a PhD program in microbiology, applied microbiology, and a master program in applied microbiology, both with scholarships, actually FATEME, uh, Nahid and Hossein, my uh, Iranian students right now in my lab, all have um, done great. And I'm very excited to, to meet some of the students if, if you guys have any questions or interest in coming to Mexico. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, if uh, don't have any question, uh, maybe Dr. Robin uh, have to leave the uh, meeting because <laughs> <Need It's sleep. laughs> thank you thank you thank but you very I, much again thank you I very much try to follow the recordings. no question and uh, thank you very much again for good presentation and attractive for us and uh, i hope uh, join with you and your colleagues in mexico and unal university thank you very much Doctor. thank you have a good day thank you much have a good time have a good time i hope uh, visited you in Mexico. Of during... course, you're welcome. Yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.
Yes. Uh, hello, our dear listener, viewer, uh, with your permissions, uh, I just want to talk briefly about the approach, uh, steps of uh, designing a drug bioinformatics for beginning to end. Uh, if you want to a bit introduction about this subject that I say, as we know, uh, due to the increasing resistance of microorganisms to antibiotics, the control of infections, uh, as you know, has become very difficult. Uh, therefore, better and uh, more efficient drug design is one of the challenges ahead. And uh, drug discovery, design, and development medicine by traditional method, as you know, is very also a bit, uh, a bit uh, time-consuming process. And there are many steps, as you know, this is slide. For example, uh, the multiplexes takes about one year. Lead compound identification before heat, it takes one year. Or, uh, for example, uh, investigation new drug, as you know, three phase of clinical trial. For example, phase one clinical, it takes about three years. Also, phase two like this, and phase three uh, also like uh, two years. Uh, finally. According to your drug design traditionally, drug will be approved for uh, marketing and you get uh, to access some of the people. But as you see, and a bit more for in, more information about this uh, slide that I say, this is a multiple time consuming process. Uh, <clears throat> to overcome uh, and to solve this problem that I said, that we have, a new method and approach uh, uh, we use to drug design, most of which are bioinformatic and along with the other important approaches such as, for example, in vitro in vivo, can provide a better result. In the reason, uh, we help uh, from bioinformatic to solve some of the problem that I said before two slides. This is a brief of uh, approach to drug design uh, before you to do uh, in vivo or uh, uh, ex vivo uh, experiments that uh, more information to another slide. But uh, before uh, uh, you uh, designing uh, this approach, I should say we have two main parts of drug design bioinformatically. Yep. One, finding drug targets. Two, finding uh, and or selecting a molecules uh, that goes or target effective. This is two main part uh, before you to uh, execute your mind uh, that in your uh, you have idea. But uh, this is the questions, what's in silico approach for drug designs? If you want to drug design at the, the, the first, uh, uh, you need uh, to access the original structure of target protein, which is can be downloaded, for example, validation experimental approach, for example, crystallography or NMON and electromyscopy and so present in the, uh, some of the data banks. Of course, PDB, one of the most important to you can download your target. But if you have no information about your uh, structure, your proton, and you, you have to design a drug against it, uh, you have to do hemorrhagic-based modeling, basis of sequence similarity develop uh, evolutionary protein, according to some of the uh, approach or tools, you can use it. And I will more information to next slide. Uh, but uh, the formal step in symbol modeling is you have to find template recognitions. So this includes query on non amino acid sequence against already existence one is the protein data bank in order to identify terminal sequence uh, that whose uh, structure are resolved. But this terminal sequence, if we want to design, you have to refer and to some of the database, of course, blast. Amino acid uh, sequence alignment. But after you do hemology or you can uh, retrieve your data from data bank, you have to dine refinement model on your target. Refinement modeling is one of the important things to uh, solve some of the problems. What's happened, your, for example, look into your target protein or your side change of your target protein is important because some of the tools you cannot completely design and your target protein target protein clearly and completely for you. In the reason, uh, you have to use some of the tools uh, to solve this problem as you have some of the algorithms uh, to 
energy minimized for your target protein, for example, amber, char, 2, 2, and MU3, and on so on, you can use for this subject. As I said, uh, refined modeling to uh, divide it to subsets, loop modeling and side change uh, uh, refinement. Uh, loop modeling, why does mean loop modeling? As some of the definition, we have the sum of the article. Uh, modeling of side change, uh, loop modeling, insertion of substitution of amino acid into the sequence to homologous protein are known as loops, uh, which need uh, tends to variable portion of protein. Of course, in template loop based modeling, the missing loop region sequence segment search in a template protein for modeling. If that uh, more information about it, your target protein, it needs to do at the first as a no denevo methods. Uh, also, I said before, side change will is important to substitution side change on backbone structure. Uh, the model side change or analyze it through their uh, uh, statistical methods, as you know, uh, root mean score deviation or MST, to balance or check your backbone before or after your, your modeling. To get bit uh, structure and stability of protein, that if you want to drug this on again, it is uh, very perfect. Uh, after your modeling, uh, your protein, it is necessary to validation. It's one of the important is. And the reason some of the tools were designed for this uh, situation. Uh, there are many tools and web server to solve this problem. For example, WhatsApp, what if, wider, and so on. And uh, some of the tools that can uh, help you to validation or, or assessment your protein that is it okay or not. Of course, uh, for modeling, you can use some of the uh, tools or web server for your, uh, in fact, uh, design your protein as one of the most important Swiss PDB viewer of, or for example, ITASL or offline, for example, Modeler uh, 10 version is very uh, uh, important and can you help you to drag your design. The main part of drug design, uh, the informatically, of course, it is needs to uh, search or uh, or your uh, design your small molecule according to some of the uh, approach. For example, if you want to in your mind uh, to design a drug again as your protein, and you have uh, to design according chemically, but you don't have any information yet. You can uh, drug uh, download from some of the database, for example. Uh, NCBI PubCamp, Zinc Database, Drug Punk, and Chem Inventable to uh, uh, assessment your drug against uh, uh, a, a large of your a small vehicle in drug points, for example, about one to thousand drug you download and insert to your tools to uh, assessment your against your target protein. But uh, if you want to do uh, is uh, to find a small molecule again as your protein. But it is necessary to do virtual screening. Uh, why to do virtual screening? If you want to find a, a subset of your drug as a you know active leads uh, after you find a heat drugs uh, to uh, assessment on again as your drug. There. If you want to do like this, uh, we have two approach. A structure based. You have to do some of the tools to solve this problem. For example, molecular diet docking study or ligand bus, as you know, I say will uh, uh, next slide about ligand bus, for example, a QP soil. Uh, for example, some of the uh, approach for designing for this uh, situation, we have a, a article about this subject, uh, uh, potential inhibitor of OXT10 enzyme expression pseudomonas originases, again, it's of million compound present in the zectant base that uh, Maleti uh, uh, do on his uh, subject. Uh, uh, as but I said before, to a screening, virtual screening, it is not necessary to molecular dynamic, molecular docking, excuse me, molecular docking study or uh, to understand it, uh, uh, how to interaction between your ligand and target protein. This is the first step for drug design your assessment. Uh, also, if we have to do uh, this uh, approach, of course, divided to subsets, for example, production protein ligand binding orientations, 
how to affinity your target or drugs to against your target protein, for example, as a receptor or other things in the cells. But uh, B, identify active sites of proteins important as you this is slide because uh, some of the part of pro proteins important, for example, uh, uh, is an enzymatic site. Uh, when, do, when you design drug against this site, you can to down regulate of your target protein if you have, for example, in the cancer cells uh, to uh, eliminate your, your cells. Uh, uh, for this situation, we have many tools for the, to do. For example, for find active site, just pick your site finder and molecular visual doctor can be help you to find and Sorry, it seems that uh, we lost Dr. Afgar. Dr. Afgar, can you hear us? Please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, yes, I hear. I feel, uh, my connected just. Uh, we, uh, we lost your uh, slides. Yes, 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 yes. Just a moment. Uh, yes. Can you see? Uh, not yet. Just a moment, try again. Uh, I want to share my slides. Just a moment. Joint meeting. Can you see? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, just it, to uh, full screen, you, excuse me. Yeah, it, it would be better if you make it in full screen. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you again. But one of the tools, Cyblex 2, this is mechanism antibiotic. In different class of beta lactamase experience, some of the article can be help you and very attractive. But after you do, the are going to find the binding infinity drug again as a protein. It is necessary to do QSR as a quantitative structure activity relationship. This uh, models, uh, in fact, to assessment correlation between biological and function and physical-chemical characteristic. Uh, in fact, this also uh, divided to subset uh, comparative molecular fight analysis as a CAMFA and comparative molecular similarity in disease analysis as a CAMZIA. Some other tools can be helpful for this uh, steps, syllabus two and Dorgon, one of the important. And the pharmacoformal thing, when you to do QSR under your protein and to find pharmacophore, some of the features and characteristics in your protein can be connected to your proteins and affect your target protein for upregulation and upregulation protein. Some of, one of the uh, um, tools can be hypogen and phase and for QSR toolbox. And uh, after that, you need to molecular dynamic simulation because we want to assessment your stability of protein, of course, complex or not, or free or only your protein. Uh, of course, it, it was done according to root mean square deviation, root mean square fluctuation, radius of your durations. And one of the important things, intramolecular hydrogen bond formation for analogy to check uh, stability of your complex. It is important for drug design. This is one of the example for design your, again, some of the bacteria. And this is the, the lattice slide to more information to the subject. Add me prediction. After you do all that this I said in this slide, uh, you have to do add me prediction. 
to assessment, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and extraction. It can do beyond form reticle. Of course, we have to do it traditionally, but we can do it before to directionally to assessment it beyond form reticle. It is, depends on lipistic role of five plates. For example, white of ligand should not exist at 500 Daltons. H we do not, not be must less than five. H1 acceptor must be below 10, egg plot should be below, and number rotation bond of your target below 10. Of course, they have many tools for this subject. For instance, per admin, Swiss admin, and so on. Thanks for the nice presentation. This is a briefly about your, uh, this lecture about how to design a drug against your target, pro pro target protein before you two traditional limiters. I'm at the service you any question about this lecture. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Any questions? Uh, you can see the chat box. Yes, yes just a moment. I, I, I will read just a moment. No question. No question. question, of course. Uh, uh, this is some suggestion for his registration. But thank you, Doctor Afkari, your presentation. And uh, I uh, check the chat box. I don't see any question from you. After the meeting, we can uh, time. We have time for the question. At the moment, uh, just uh, only uh, time permission to me and uh, share the uh, new uh, meeting and new subject. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, you can see my desktop. Yes. Uh, yes. Please change to uh, full screen mode. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I don't understand. Hello again. Thank you very much for your participant. And uh, uh, I'm Dawood Kalantar from Kerma University of Medical Science. And uh, my subject about biosensors in medical and use of biosensors in medical microbiology. Over the past few years, biosensors have generated widespread attention for being accurate, rapid, sensitive, and highly selective technology in diagnosis of uh, Various infection disease at yeah, an affordable cost. Uh, at the moment, the biosensor uh, used in detection of foot bone uh, and the nosocomial infection in very area. And uh, maybe in future, uh, we have exchange uh, to detection of many infection by biosensor uh, biosensors and. Uh, 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 maybe uh, change uh, to uh, conventional method to uh, biosensor method for detection uh, infection and uh, also other other disorder in uh, human such as cancer. At the moment, uh, infection disease during the years uh, led to the high mortality in the world. In the development country or developing countries, we have a lot of uh, uh, mortality about the infection disease. 
in foodborne or nosocomial infection and other infection in the uh, world. For example, bacteria, parasitic virus. For example, in this table, you can see different pathogen bacteria uh, in, according to the report uh, for WHO, other countries such as USA, Canada, Australia, England, and Wales, and Netherlands. You can see a lot of uh, uh, rate of infection in this region for uh, uh, about bacteria or parasite. At the moment, on the other hand, uh, we developed the, uh, the patient with incompromision immunosystem. We have a lot of uh, infection in future in about area. We have different methods for detection, pathogenic agents in uh, clinical sample or uh, no clinical sample, uh, for example, water or food. We have different conventional methods such as PCR, real-time PCR, culture, microscopy, immunoassay, such as ELISA. But recently, several diagnosis plat uh, platform have been developed in detection pathogenic or biologic marker. For example, biologic marker, RNA, DNA, glycoprotein, enzyme, antibody, hormone, organ, or whole cell. Whole cell uh, may be used for detection uh, the cancer in the biosensor system. Uh, in this uh, area, uh, in the first, uh, I speak about what is a biosensor. What is a biosensor? It, this is very important. A biosensor is a device which measures living organisms or biological molecules to detect chemical pers present in living organisms. It is a, 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 a small sentence about the biosensors. Uh, we have some uh, terms in biosensors. And uh, I speak about this analyte, bioreceptor, and transducer. What is analyte? Analyte is a compound uh, such as glucose, ura, uh, and, uh, and uh, drugs, uh, and, and uh, anything. Concentration has been measured. Basically, biosensors include quantitative study different, different substances by converting to biological action into measurable signal. For instance, histidine rich protein 2 is an analyte in a biosensor that is designed, uh, designed to detect uh, malaria, for detection malaria, because malaria at the moment is a big problem in the world, but we have a, a lot of mortality about the uh, malaria in the world, but uh, we can use. A section of, another section about the biosensor ha, is a bioreceptor. What is bioreceptor? Bioreceptor, it is an, a molecule that specifically recognizes the analyte, such as enzyme cell, up, uh, optamer, desoxyribonucleic acid, and antibody act as a bioreceptor. Bioreceptor, a different biosensor. Biorecognition is process generation of a signal in the, from a light, pH, mass change, or change by the interaction of the bioreceptor with the analyte. There are multiple bio, uh, there are multiple bioreceptors uh, that are commonly uh, used in the developed biosensor for malaria. For example, for malaria diagnosis such as DNA optamer and uh, a, a specific antibody and a, sp a specific uh, peptide in the pathogen or any things. For example, uh, cell cancer we can use no problem. Uh, but uh, the bioreceptor uh, the, in the figure you in the figure you can see about the uh, bioreceptor or uh, bio recognition elements antibody enzyme DNA cell uh, can detect by uh, bioreceptor. Sometimes uh, in the some article you can see bioreceptor change to bioreactor. No different. It is the term or bioreceptor or bioreactor, no problem. Another uh, section for the uh, biosensor is transducer. Trans what is transducer in the biosensor? In a biosensor, the function of transducer include, include, include conversion of biomarker, huh? 
detection view marker ha or view recognition even in the measurable signal. This method, this method uh, of uh, energy conversion is now as signalization because the uh, because uh, uh, the recognition with a bioreactor or bioreceptor, the signal uh, of re uh, recognition sent to transduce, transducer, transducer change this signal, at, uh, a response or to a signal measurable for detection. Most transducers produce a either optical or electrical signal that are usually uh, proportional to amount of analyte view receptor interaction. Gold nanoparticle with uh, uh, gold uh, nanoparticle with poly uh, di uh, dianyl dimethyl and another chemical uh, polymer ha used in in the uh, transducer ha. Electrochemical impedance spectrometry use a transducer. Uh, in the next slide, you can see you can see a principle of component of different generation of uh, uh, biosensor. We have different generation of biosensor. Huh? The first generation two and the, the third generation of biosensor. Huh? The general of, of design that the biosensor is to enable rapid combinant testing. Yes. There are three so-called generation of biosensor uh, biosensors uh, and can see this uh, figure. The first generation uh, biosensor had the normal product reaction diffused to the transducer and caused the electrical response. And uh, many different between the different generation of uh, biosensor. Uh, uh, more uh, different in transducer. Transducer is uh, very important to uh, product a signal for detection. And uh, transducer uh, sent uh, uh, some signal to detector for uh, detection of uh, pathogen or another things. Uh, in summary, you can see a, a structure of biosensor again. Bioreactor or bioreceptor is the same. Bioreactor can be enzyme, cell, optomer, DNA, and nanoparticle. Huh? So we have different bioreactor or bi different bioreceptor, uh, yes? And the uh, two section is transducer. Transducer, we have different transducer, phototiode, trimeter, pH, electrode, quartz, electrode, and transducer sent a signal to uh, another section of the biosensor heart is the uh, plus three, yes? Signal processing unit. It is a detector uh, that uh, we have different this uh, type of uh, uh, detector in the biosensor. In another figure in the next slide, you can see uh, again, the, uh, the process of detection in biosensor. Huh? Yes, uh, for the first step, bioreactor or biosensor detect the biomarker. Biomarker may be cell, maybe DNA, may anything, RNA, uh, protein, enzyme, and act. Send the, uh, some data to transducer. Transducer change the data to the signal. Signal sent to amplifier, the uh, tree section and sent a signal data for uh, detection because sig signal must detectable. Yes, the amplifier uh, data from transfer change to the signal for detection. In this figure, you can uh, see a view sensor how can be classified according to their uh, transducer type, the, uh, nature, uh, biological compound, and bioreactor. Biosensor, huh? yes, again, it is important, this, uh, the structure of biosensor. Huh? Biosensor, huh? Uh, biosensors can be the divided to bioreceptor or bioreactor, uh, transducer. Yes, we have different, we have different bioreceptor, 
and the um, transducer in uh, biosensor. You can see uh, different. At the moment, the newly uh, or novel method used in biosensor use a nanoparticle. Nanoparticle uh, use, uh, use uh, uh, in the biosensors uh, for detection of different, uh, different pathogen, how different uh, uh, cancer cells. It is uh, uh, the nanoparticle uh, are developing in uh, use of them in biosensors. And uh, you, in the biosensor systems, uh, we can uh, a lot of uh, uh, we can use a lot of type of nanoparticle, especially gold, gold nanoparticle, silver nanoparticle in different area. At the moment, we have a lot of, we have a lot of uh, biosensors for detection of a, uh, cell uh, pathogen, different pathogen, real pathogen, bacterial pathogen, uh, pa pa parasite and fungi. At the moment, uh, uh, also, a biosensor high use for uh, detection cell, uh, cell cancer and different uh, cancer in human. The uh, type method in biosensing is very different. Some uh, biosensors are based on the optical method, uh, and some biosensors are based on mass sensitivity and nanomaterial based sensor high. Sensors is very important. In this table, you can see uh, some conventional methods. Uh, it is this is like the end of a slide because we don't have time. Uh, 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 my time is over, uh, and uh, try uh, 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 only uh, speak uh, one minute. Uh, in this table, you can see different method for detection of, for example, anything: cancer cell, pathogen, and different pathogen viral. And act. Uh, conventional method, for example, carturing, uh, microscopic fluorescent, capillary based immunoassay, fluorescent by immunoassay, ELISA, ELISA based PCR or real time PCR. It is conventional method, maybe need a, a cost, maybe need a, a lot of time, but uh, and response time and limit of detection. For, uh, and uh, the uh, another section of a uh, table, you can see biosensing method. Biosensing method, you can see uh, the lim limitation of detection and copy number of things. You can see uh, the biosensor how in biosensors in uh, uh, a low time, you can detect, uh, they can detect different things. For example, uh, fib optic based immunobiosensor biosensors uh, or QSM based immunobiosensors and optomeric sold uh, biosensors uh, in uh, three minutes uh, can see uh, detect different uh, uh, things if you want. But, uh, however, the biosensors. Uh, at the moment, uh, maybe doesn't use a lot, doesn't use a lot, but uh, in the future, and uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of problem for detection uh, of uh, pathogens in clinical samples. Yes, uh, and the fast detection or rapid detection and uh, uh, detection of uh, uh, pathogen in various samples, uh, it is important to good treatment, properly treatment of the infection. It is important uh, in future we, we can uh, detect pathogens, different pathogen with accuracy, with rapid time, and detection exactly the type of the pathogen. Biosensors bio can detect rapid, can detect accuracy, 
can and help to treatment of infection in future. At the moment, we don't, uh, I don't have time uh, because uh, uh, the time uh, is over. And thank you for your attention. I try to uh, speak fastly for participant and uh, excuse me if uh, 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 I have to, I have to uh, uh, speak rapidly or fast. Thank you very much. Uh, if, uh, ha uh, if you have any question, uh, uh, you, you can ask as me and uh, I try to speak about your question if you want. Do you have any question? Okay, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, another subject in this meeting uh, about the uh, nanotechnology and uh, we wait for Dr. Uh, Osanlu for your presentation. Dr. Osanlu? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. I can see, you see, you see, yes. No problem. The video and the sound is good. You can start. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I shared my screen. The screen are seen? Yes, yes, yes. Hello, everybody. I hope the Congress program has been useful so far. I am Mahmoud Osando from Pasta University of Medical Science. This university was established 44 years ago, and Pasta is a town in the of Pars Prominence. I want to talk for a few minutes about the application of nanotechnology in the development of natural antibiotic. I go to the main point without wasting time. There has been much talk about the bacterial resistance to antibiotics in recent days, recent days, so there is no need to repeat it. In bacterial resistance, the amount of antibiotics used by patients should be increased, and this issue causes side effects in the body. In short, bacterial resistance and side effects are current concern of health systems around the world. In this regard, herbal antibiotics have received renewed attention recently. Due to the high purity of essential oils, they have received more attention. A screening of antibiotics antibacterial properties of plant essential oils, or their main constituent is one of the hot research fields worldwide. However, the most important challenges of using essential oils as antibiotic is that they are less effective than chemicals. You must have read word of nanotechnology. Nano is one of the standard unit. Its literal meaning is dot. In Persian means kutule. Nanotechnology is defined as targeted manipulation of materials in the nano scales to obtaining size dependent properties. Why this is a important matter. In the nano scales, the surface to volume ratio increases. Surface atom or molecules have a high energy. Thus, nanomaterials have a higher activity than bulk materials. This feature is used in the pharmaceutical industry to improve the effectiveness of drug or essential oils. However, hydrophobicity of essential oils must be adjusted for use as antibiotics. 
So different donor formulations have developed depending on desired application. I will try to summarize some commonly used donor formulation based on researches I have done. The list of copies are seen in this slide. One, non-emulsions. Non-emulsions are a mixture of oil and, and, and aqueous phase with the droplet in nanoscales. The high water content and presence of surfactants make the non-emulsions desirable as a hand rubber. In the mentioned research, the antibacterial effect of both pre non-emulsions were substantially more potent than microemulsions micro or non-formulated non essential oils. It is worth to note that we use Shiraz team and peppermint as antibacterial agent. Two, nanogels. Nanogels are semi-solid formulations. Their capacity to load a high amount of essential oil and possessing higher viscosity than non-emulsions make them proper formulation for topical delivery in lesion or wounds. In the mentioned research, the nanogel of Shiraz team was used again. By applying it, growth of four important human bacteria was completely inhibited. The examined bacteria was were including a Staphylococcus aureus, a Shershia coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Klebsia pneumonia. Three, nanofibers containing essential oils. Two subjects are important in the wound healing process. One, prevention of bacterial or fungal infection, and two, chemical or physical support for improving the wound healing process. Nanofibers, sorry, nanofibers with nanometric pores physically prevent from entering environmental pathogens into the wound. In recent years, preparation of essential oil loaded nanofibers has received more attention. In such nanoformulations, both mentioned factors are provided. Nanofibers act as physical barriers and essential oil as antibodies. Four, polymeric or lipidic nanoparticle containing essential oils. Polymeric or lipid nanoparticle are two types of common nanoformulation for systemic injection. By loading essential oils in nanocarriers, batches of essential oils are provided. On the other hand, due to the nanoscales of carriers, the penetration through cell walls is improved. Therefore, hundreds of essential oils droplets are entering to the site. Efficacy is thus improved. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope I have been able to, pro to provide good clues to the main topics in the preparation of herbal nanoformulation. My email address is visible. I will, I will be happy to any scientific help. Any questions, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Osanlu. Thank you for a good presentation and uh, attractive for me. Thank you very much. Everybody have a question you can ask uh, and uh, Dr. Osanlu responds to the answers. Uh, Dr. Osanlu, you can ch ch check the chat box and uh, see uh, if uh, any question. Bye. In this i don't see any, anything there is yes, no, yes. No, no. Question. There's yes. no question thank, thank you. you so much have a good have a good time bye 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 uh, at the moment for the latest uh, subject in this area in detection and treatment of an infection disease uh, uh, Permission to me uh, share a screen for uh, Dr. Dadashi. For
Sorry, it seems that Dr. Kantari has got disconnected. Uh, Dr. Dadashi, if you are uh, with us in the room, please start your video. Dr. Dadashi. Dr. Faisal Abadi, we have you, your video and also we have your voice. Thank you very much. Uh, hello and good morning to all my colleagues, especially uh, the invited speakers from uh, south of Iran, Kerman, Rafsanjan, uh, and Fasa. Uh, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed these uh, lectures. Uh, today's lectures uh, are quite different from the previous days because uh, microbiology uh, is multidisciplinary and is related uh, to many disciplines and area of medicines, agriculture, food science, food microbiology, uh, microbiota, microbiome. So the, the subjects that my colleagues uh, selected for this panel uh, are very important uh, in applied microbiology. I thank Dr. Kalantar for organizing this uh, special panels and uh, uh, we are sure that in the future we need to work more on this area, bioinformatics, nano microbiology, for example, biosensors uh, and new uh, therapeutics agents developed by uh, microbiologists uh, against uh, uh, bugs, against pathogens, and also a new metabolites from microorganisms against other diseases such as cancers and also some syndromes. So this is very, very important. Uh, I appreciate your efforts and all the speakers. 